Hey, all you tenors, welcome to The Quad, where we start the conversation on hot topics, timely news stories, and all the happenings that are on the tip of everyone's tongue. We're bringing diverse opinions and personalities into Studio 50 for an around the horn mashup loaded with spontaneity, sincerity, and of course, a little fire. Get ready for some Times 5 fun. Let's go. Welcome to the quad. I'm so excited. We're doing something different today, Lori. Tee it up. Tee it up. Yeah, we are bringing on two different people with different political lenses, and we're going to go there. We're going to talk politics. And Michelle, you know that, it, especially you, we have tried to stay away from politics. We are 100% going to stay away from religion, but this is a unique situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's important. We want to get the conversation started. We see the divide and you know what, let's, I think we just, I think we, we give an opportunity to hear both sides, Democrat, Republican. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. So we have on the Democratic side, we actually have someone from back in my days at West Point. He's a West Point graduate, uh, served our country and did Desert Storm. And then he became a very successful executive and is actually throwing his hat in the ring, which I love, giving up the high fluting job to try to make a difference. He's running for U.S. Senate uh, for the state of Maryland, and his name is Juan Dominguez. And then on the other side of the aisle, we have Kira Davis. So she is a Republican pundit. She's an author. She has her own podcast. She's been on Fox and and this is her jam. So she loves to talk and chop up the conservative point of view. Let's go, Michelle. Let's go. All right. Okay, Kira and Juan, welcome to Studio 50. And as I like to say, Zikwan. You like that? A little, little, little French Thank accent, you. you know. They are known for their baguettes. Okay. So we have teed this up. We are going to have a party and hopefully a little bit spicy discourse on our current political landscape. And I'm really looking forward to this. We've got, you know, two people on either side of the aisle, but also I think with a lot of commonalities as I look at your platforms. So Carol, let's start with you. Uh, the, the big question is why is our democracy failing? And when we mean by that is why can we not get anything done on Capitol Hill? <laughs> I love this question, actually, because I I think it denotes a misunderstanding about the history of our government and how it's supposed to work. The question itself denotes the idea that it ever worked. And um, there's never been a time in American history where running the government has gone smoothly or people haven't been very passionate about it. I love reading original historical documents and letters from our founding fathers. And if you read those, even back then, I mean, they were brutal with each other. The first Congress was, was massively divided. They didn't even agree on how to prosecute the Revolutionary War. You guys, we are... We barely made it. Do you understand in America? Like we barely made it to being America. There were so many decisions along the way where just one person had said no or just one group had agreed to split. We never would have made it. So the idea that we've ever had some kind of uh, smooth time where everyone in our government agreed and worked together smoothly to get things done, that's just not a reality that time has never existed and the other thing is i don't know how much we want congress to get done now congress does get some things done obviously because we feel the effects in our lives from from time to time and there are big events that happen in which congress gets things done after a lot of battling but um you know here in california our our uh, congressional cabinet passes 700 laws a year. The governor had 20, 220 on his desk this year. When your government is working, <laughs> it's doing a lot more than it should. So it's actually supposed to be hard to get stuff done in DC. It's supposed to be. You've got two different sides working and they're battling. And so I, I just think I... I 
not to sound insulting, but I think it's a naive perspective to think okay. that our democracy is supposed to be some some utopian exercise. It's messy. Okay. Th that was a curveball. I wasn't expecting an answer, actually, but I like the take. Um, and you're coming from the standpoint of less government is better government. Okay, Juan, you're you're leaving a high, you know, flying corporate executive, you know, job to throw your hat in the ring for U.S. Senate in the great state of Maryland. What do you think about that? Well, uh, so here's what I think. Number one, uh, Kira is a worthy adversary here. She's quoting historical documents and the founding fathers and stuff. So I don't know that I went far enough back. Uh, what Here's what I'll say. I'll take your question and I'm going to parse it into two uh, two points. Lori, I think, why is our democracy failing? And then more importantly, why is our country failing, right? So our democracy is failing because our legislators no longer speak to each other. The Republicans and Democrats, it's it's a, it's a, there's several reasons for it. One, it's 24 hour TV, right? It's the oxygen that is sucked up by 24 hour cable TV and the soundbite culture that we live in, as opposed to the get things done culture that we should be living in. Social media, another one, and ultimately money, right? At the end of the day, I think that both sides, and that's why I'm running this insurgent campaign, don't want to get things done because they're perfectly fine with the status quo. And money dictates the status, the status quo on both sides. Big money, lobbyists, PACs, super PACs, they have a vested interest in keeping things pretty much the way they are, because that protects the top 1%. So now I'll go quickly to why do I think the country's failing? I think the country's failing because there's never been a time in our history where the gap between the haves and the have-nots has been bigger. And what you're looking at is if that trend continues, I think you're looking at revolution or a police state. And you could say that we were very close to the police state with our last president. Okay. <laughs> All right, I, I'm gonna- um, I think it's is, getting spicy now. This oh, is great. Go. I, I wanna flip it over to Michelle real quick and then Kira, we're, we're gonna give you a chance to counter punch. Um, so we've talked about this, Michelle, media. And you know, I feel like we have talked about the dumbing down of our society and Juan, you just said it, sound bite culture, snacking video culture, and people not- reading and going in depth and deep diving. So give your two takes on the media, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, we live we live in a highlight reel and I think Juan said it best. I mean, it's, you know, we take these snippets. People are, people are out there working. People can't pay their bills. They come home, they're scrolling through TikTok or, you know, obviously the algorithm is, is feeding you what you're gonna see. They see a couple clips and, you know, I mean, you know what I love? I love those clips where they're out on the street and they ask people questions about politics and they can't even answer <laughs> the basic, the bare minimum. I mean, people have bigger problems on their head. They're just trying to survive. And so the stuff, you know, a lot of this stuff just doesn't matter, but the media definitely drives the narrative. I, I've always said, you know, again, I'm not, I'm a different side of media. I'm not on that side. But I feel like they get together and they're like, these are the talking points for the day. And everybody spits out the same, you know, they keep regurgitating platitudes. And so it's, you know, that's that's my take on it. I, I always tell people, take that stuff with a grain of salt. Don't don't consume too much and be careful and and do what you're do this. Talk to people of different opposing views, you know, and then decide for yourself. Yeah. And don't be afraid to actually read. It's a good thing. And uh, I always like to look at like BBC or the Australian news to kind of get a different perspective as well. Okay, Kira, back to you, the haves and the have nots. All right. I've got a different lens on this. I do believe the chasm is widening at a frightening pace. I do believe this country was built on the paradigm of having a healthy middle class. However, I feel like we're on a dangerous slope where we're punishing really hard workers and people that are considered in that successful band of financial security in order to subsidize some people. What What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I actually agree with Juan. I did chuckle at his comment about Trump's administration being a police state. I'm not sure what he couldn't do then that he 
can do now. But I, I do think that uh, Trump invites a lot of hyperbole. However, I do agree with Juan that the that the chasm is widening between the haves and have nots. But the but the solution to that is to aid the middle class. The reason why it's widening is because we're instituting all kinds of policies that put the burden squarely on the middle class. Yeah. So, for instance our out of control entitlement state, which may have started as one thing, but now has just ballooned into something that is uncontrollable, it squeezes the middle class, right? It doesn't squeeze the wealthy because they get around with it, tax breaks, lawyers, accountants, knowing people, lobbying. It doesn't affect the poor because they get the benefits of the entitlement, but it's the middle class that is getting taxed to death to support all of this. When we talk about forgiving student loan debt, that's a burden for the middle class. When COVID hit and our governments were closing down businesses, what did they leave open? Costco, Walmart, Target, who got shut down? The middle class, people who barely make their bills each month. And then when the middle class complains, there are a whole, there is a an entire genre, if you will, of politicians and political pundits who then call us selfish or call us greedy because we want to take more of our tax dollars home. The tax bar burden on the middle class is absolutely out of control. We're middle class here in California. My husband got a raise a few years ago and it actually cost us money. We got $19 less per paycheck because it moved them into the next tax bracket. We're not wealthy. In fact, we're the people that particularly people on the left say are are not experiencing the American dreams. We're a, we're a black family that came from poverty and we worked ourselves up to the middle class. So we want to stay here and we've worked really hard to provide that life for our kids. But when you're being squeezed constantly, uh, I think Juan is right. I think his I think his perception of what is going to happen, the idea that people are restless and restlessness can have some pretty deep consequences which we may see in the next election cycle. I think he's absolutely right on that. The, the divide is huge, yeah, but it, I, I believe it's because of poor progressive policies. Ding, ding. Okay, um, I'm gonna send it over your way, sending hot lead in, in Juan's corner here. Um, so, no, wait, go ahead. Wait, wait, so I just wanna caveat this, is one of the frustrations that I have had as just someone who is um, taking it all in is I feel like we've become... We, we helicopter money, okay? When there's a problem, we typically helicopter the money in. So the people that really need the money aren't getting enough. And the people that don't need it are getting, so student loan is, is a prime example of just a blanket policy of we're just gonna uh, alleviate student debt where the people that really need the help with their education and its cost basis aren't getting enough. All right, with that being said, let's send it back your way, Juan. So I love what all of you have said. I'm going to try to tie this thread together through this three-way thread here real quickly. Let's go back to what Michelle was saying about people uh, just worried about paying their bills. 37% of Marylanders, 37% of Americans have a hard time figuring out what bills they're going to pay next month. So that's rent, that's food, food for their children sometimes, right? Hey, do I pay the electric bill or do I skimp on food near the end of the month? That should never happen in this country, in this land of plenty. Nine million children who are food insecure. It's 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 a crime. So I have a plan for you. Not putting more burden on the middle class, Kira. I think you'll like this. I've got what I call a Robin Hood and poverty wealth tax, which will be reinvested. <laughs> you like that in a Robin Hood. You have another tax one? You're after it, it, that. Hold on, hold, it's, it's, it's a good one. In a Robin Hood and poverty dividend. So in America, the three wealthiest Americans have more wealth than the bottom 50% of the country. I don't begrudge my wealthy friends because I have a few of them. And I would say they worked hard and that's fantastic. Now it's time to reinvest in America. So for those that make 10 million, excuse me, net worth of 10 million to a billion, 2% tax per year. For those that have a billion or more, 6% tax a year. If you've got a billion or more, you don't need another yacht. You don't need another vacation home. You don't need another car. Or you can get those, but maybe they won't be as big as we take a trillion dollars a year 
And as Kira was saying, you give it to qualifying families, no government program, straight into their paychecks, $1,000 per month for dual income households in Maryland, $60,000 or less, or $1,000 a month for a single uh, breadwinner at $30,000 a month. Helps them pay for food, helps them pay for rent, helps them save for a small business, all sorts of things. You cannot close the income inequality gap faster than that. Building new schools or reforming schools, years. Building low-income housing, years. But we could start to close that wealth gap with that plan right there. Okay, all I get it. These, I all of these solutions, though, this is this is why I left the Democrat Party, because all of these solutions involve more burden, right? They involve taking more from someone else. Why is the solution, one never releasing people of the burden? So rather than saying these people need to be taxed more, more money needs to be taken from someone else and given to someone, what if we just release the burden and let the economy work. So it's fine, Juan, to say, I'm going to drop another $30 per week on your paycheck, Kira. But do you know that when I went to the store yesterday to buy ground beef, the price had jumped $7. And I'm looking, paying for four pounds, less than four pounds of, of low grade ground beef was $22. So that what I need is for the policies that are making the price of the meat go up for the policies that are requiring um, more of the of the corporations that make these products for the policies that are taking more money out of the pockets of the wealthy people who are actually producing the jobs. And then that trickles down to my costs at the store. That's what I want. I don't need you to take more money from somebody else, especially when someday I would like to be wealthy. So I don't need that promise I, that I, more I, of that money is going I'd to like, be. I'd like you to be wealthy too. Trickle down economics doesn't work. I can point you to a thousand textbooks that show that when our country started to lose the middle class was during the Re Reagan revolution, trickle down economics. Everything, <laughs> that down. is not true. And I oh, could quote is. a thousand texts too that say trickle down does work. And we know that trickle down works because it works in your own life. It when doesn't you, work. When you set an example for your kids, that trickles down into their lives. When you make more money, your whole family makes more money. Your whole family has more prosperity. When you, when you succeed in your community, your whole community succeeds. A rising tide lifts all boats. So and anecdotally even that's not true yeah um, i um, think that's a talking point okay i'll let you finish i'm finished kira in the 40s 50s and 60s and 70s we had the strongest middle class in this country that we've ever had when we dropped the marginal tax rate from 90 percent on the richest so i'm not talking about taking your income and taxing it at 90 percent. i'm talking about the wealthy paying their fair share the moment the highest tax rates went from 80 90 70 percent down to 37%. We don't have the money now to invest in our roads. We don't have the money to invest in our infrastructure. We don't have the money to pay for basic. We, even haven't, even, we haven't even gotten a healthcare. How is it that the wealthiest country on earth can't afford healthcare for all? That's a great Britain, question. They do it in France. They do it in Canada. And that's- I'm from Canada. I'm Canadian. I grew up under universal healthcare. We don't want it. Second of all, um, why is the conversation always about the government having more rather than the government tightening its belt? You know, during the last government shutdown, when the national parks were shut down and the army wasn't getting their pay and other branches of the military were, were under duress about getting their pay, I started calling the organizations on Capitol Hill to see who was open. And you know who was open? The administrative office to the Office of Research for Alzheimer's. So the assistant to the people who research Alzheimer's on Capitol Hill, they were open. Why do we even have two offices for Alzheimer's research in the first place in Washington, DC? Do you know what I mean? We have so much waste going on. I would be happy to talk about maybe raising taxes on people if the government ever, ever once tightened its belt. And they don't. Yes. You so, just expect me to do it. No, no. So, I don't so, want to. I want you to do it. I want you to go to Congress and make them tighten their belts. I think we're in agreement here. I'm a fiscal conservative. I don't think that we need more government programs. I agree with you. I think we need less government and less um, programs. The program I just talked about wouldn't be a program. It would just be taxing people over here 
and putting money into the pockets of people over there. The top 15% of American earners pay 70% of the taxes. So your fair share argument always rings hollow to me. The top 1% does not pay their fair share. Let, let me ask you this though. Let me let me flip this this narrative. And sure. one of the things that I have a an issue with is how do you determine the entitlement? Meaning, how do you fairly qualify people that are going to receive that benefits? Because I do think, especially coming out of the pandemic where we were helicoptering money in, there was a lot of people that took excessive, excessive um advantage of it. Absolutely. And 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 if you create this mentality that we're going to take from someone else because they they should give and give it to somebody else, I, what's the incentive for them to try harder? What's the incentive for them to be that person in the society of work hard? Just ask it. One. Well, that one. I've been talking a lot. Of that one. <laughs> sure. Sure. So it's a great point. If we put $1,000 a month into people's paychecks, are there going to be people that spend that on beer? Yes. Are there going to be people that spend that on cigarettes? Yes. Are there going to be people that spend it on even more sinful things? Yes. But I do believe that most people, I'm sure like you do, are good. And most people are going to spend that on figuring out, hey, how can I pay for my rent? How can I pay for better food for my children? How could I help my children get a better education? That That's what I believe. I believe in the goodness of humanity. So we can certainly cite examples of where there is waste, fraud, and abuse in just about any government program. But I would tell you that people have been set back more and more as our country has become more... Um, God, more segregated, right? As much as we've desegregated, we're still segregated, right? You look at uh, Black neighborhoods and the most valuable asset that a person has is their home. And when uh, there's Black neighborhoods where people live together, the net worth of those homes or, or the value of those homes aren't as big as the value of white neighborhoods, right? And, and we've kind of created this split society until we're able to reintegrate everyone in a more holistic way. You've got to provide, I think, a lifeboat for people. Or as I said, the rich people can view it as an insurance policy. Because once again, you saw uh, flashpoints during uh, Occupy Wall Street, during the Black Lives Matter summer, during the Arab uh, Spring Rising, when people like Kira had mentioned, I forget, I forget the word you use, when people have time on their hands, and are becoming disenchanted with society, that's when bad things happen. So I don't know if that answered your question completely, Lori, but hopefully it well, touched on it. I, I'll put it maybe more simply too. And Michelle, I, you know, I want you to weigh on this too. I feel like we've gotten lazy. Like I feel like there, you, let me give a prime example. So we're gonna flog someone like Cook from Apple if he makes 80 million in a year. Should anyone make 80 million a year? I don't know. But he has a device that changes lives every single day. So we want to basically crucify him for his salary. But yet Kanye West or Manny Machado, two people in pop culture, one's an athlete, one's a musician, as we know, they can sign a guaranteed $275 million contract. All right. And, and we applaud it. It's it's we. We aspire to it. So I feel like we've gotten to this point where my fear with taking and giving is that it loses the, the incentive for people to want to work hard, that we're taking away from the crux of capitalism to some degree. Let me give you, me give you two stats and then we'll kick it back over to Kira. There's 10% of Americans that are at or below the poverty rate that work three jobs. So there, there are some people out there that are that are working really hard, that they're trying to that they're trying to make it. And at a certain point, right, if you're working 60, 70, 80 hours a day trying to shuffle your kids back and forth, if you're a single mom or a single parent, you got to wonder at a certain point, hey, maybe I'll take a little bit less to stay at home because that is a, an incredibly 
daunting task to work that many hours per week. No one should have to work unless they want to 60 or 70 hours a week to have a basic subsistence. I think we could all agree on that. Give you the last stat on CEO pay. I'm not begrudging CEO. That. I don't agree with that. Okay. <laughs> I don't all right, know. hold on. You, you, you can go back to that. I'm to tell you how many hours a week you should work to be comfortable. <laughs> you can you can go you can go back to that uh, in a second. I think everyone deserves a good quality of life. I think 40 or 50 hours a week is plenty. But in the we're going to use 1950s dollars and today's dollars. Using today's dollars, holding it constant. In 1950, the average worker made thirty thousand a year. CEO made six hundred thousand a year. In Come to today using those same, holding those same dollars constant. Uh, a worker makes 30,000 a year today. How much do you think the average CEO of a publicly traded company makes? I don't care. 10 million, 10 million. I don't I think care. Well, you might not care, but regular people and working class people do I care. I am a You're, regular working class person. Go out and talk to them. Go out and talk to them on the street and they'll tell you that CEO pay is out of control. Thank God the UAW got their just rewards, that UPS got their just rewards, because you got CEOs making millions and millions of dollars, and you have people that have to work more than one job to keep the lights on at home. Okay, I'm going to, uh, Michelle, you being- aren't CEOs. No, I was just going to say, I, you know, I, and again, I'm only speaking for one, I don't think, I don't think people care. I don't, I don't care. I, I really don't care how much they make. I mean, you know what, you worked hard, whatever you can, whether you're an, whether you're a professional athlete or you're, you know, CEO of a big company. I mean, you know what, good for you. You made it. I care about what's going on in my own life. And I, that's what I feel like. I feel like people are like, I want to be able to pay my bills, take care of my kids, keep them safe, get a good education, maybe take a family, you know, trip, that type of thing. Um, I want the people are very focused as they should be on what's going on in their lives. So, you know, I would say, I don't think the average person does, does really care. I think it bothers them. Yeah. They're like, Hey, this person makes, you know, X amount of dollars, but it doesn't affect them in the day to day. So well, do and I, I feel like when, you know, look, I'm a 10 times five plus four. All right. Hey, new math for you guys. It used to be you would see someone now I came from a lower middle class neighborhood and you would see that family that took the, the trip to Aspen or you'd hear about it or they drove a nice car. And the mentality was, wow, what did they do to get there? I want that. And now I think we built this resentment and sense of, again, we're going back to this whole dialogue about entitlement. I feel like the dis the, the discourse and the paradigm has shifted and I don't think that's fair. I really don't. And and I don't care what, I think Tim Cook should make $80 million a year. He's got a lot of risk. He provides a lot of jobs. He changes the world on the daily. Elon Musk. I mean, I don't know. Why do we care what they make? I care think there's an idea and I understand what Juan is saying. Uh, because I used to, I used to be a, a, a hard carrying Democrat and, and liberal. And I think I understand that there's this idea that America is a pie. And so this is a zero sum game and there's only enough. There's only so many pieces of the pie to go around. So if you have more of the pie, someone else has less of the pie. But that I don't think is an apt analogy for what America is when it's firing on all cylinders economically. America is a buffet table. And so the more people you get to the table, the more dishes you have. So what you want to do is give people the opportunity to create their own dishes to take to the table. And the table is America. I I like the 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 drive behind Juan's positions, the idea that, hey, somebody shouldn't be working 60, 70, 80, 80 hours a week just to hold their family together. And I'm not going to make a moral judgment because maybe 60, 70, 80 hours a week gets you to Tim Cook status. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Tim Cook didn't get to oh. be the, the CEO of Apple by working 40 hours a week. So there yeah. is value in working a lot. But I want to go back to this point that Juan made about the single mom working three jobs. This is a great example about why 
instead of talking about what we can take from other people to give to somebody, we really need to, to understand the consequences of the policies that we pass. Why would someone have to work three jobs to pull together 60 hours a week of labor? That is because in 2012, Congress passed the Affordable Health Care Act, which made it a law that small businesses had to provide health care insurance to or and health care to employees who worked over a certain amount of hours a week. What was those hours? I think it's 27 or 29 hours a week. What was the response? The response wasn't a bunch of companies going, yay, we, we're going to give health insurance to all these people. The response was to cut the hours available to employees. So instead of having a company with 50 full-time jobs, you have um, a, a company now with 100 part-time jobs. And so a person can't cobble together a whole, a whole job that they need. So they have to put together these three jobs to make it. That's a Democrat policy. That's a progressive policy. That's a policy that had direct effect on the working hours of the lower class. So it's not just a conversation about what we can take from a rich person and give to a poor person. It doesn't matter if you give that person $100 if they have no way to make to sustain that $100 or to earn 100 more. Okay, well, I'm, let, let me ask you this. Let me let me throw this. If I'm a, if I'm a citizen of Maryland, yep. And and I say to you, and hearing about your policies and like, is that the solution or is that a band aid or are we solving the problem or are we? <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Because isn't the problem yeah. you're, you're putting a band aid on something? And it seems like the the solution would be to create an infrastructure where people can get ahead through education and opportunity. So it's a start, Lori, and I agree with you. We need to do much more, right? But much more takes time. And so the, I'm not gonna name cities because I don't wanna make any city look bad, but if you went into the inner city of any one of our states, well, California, Maryland, Florida, wherever, and you're born there, you're immediately born at a mammoth disadvantage. 60 to 70% of the people born there will never climb out of there. We're gonna make pretty much what their parents make. They, you know, we, we talk about the Colin Powell's and the, uh, what's that chief justice? Um, uh, can't think of his name. John right. Marshall? No, 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 no. The, um, the gentleman that's on there uh, now, Clarence Thomas. We oh, talk yeah. about them as success stories that they came out of poverty. Yes, they won the lottery. They got extremely lucky. They had mentors along the way. They had someone that shepherded their hard work. Absolutely, Kira. I'll tell you oh, what. That's you, rude. You, that's really you, rude you, to say about somebody you don't know what they you, worked for. You you're take, talking to somebody who you're talking to a black woman I, who I, came I didn't, from I didn't poverty. Interrupt, I didn't interrupt you. You take any one of us and you bring us back in time to when we're little babies and you plop us in to a single mom or a single dad or a no parent in an inner Hello. city. Well, so you were, oh. the, you, you, you were the <laughs> exception, Kara. You're, you're, yeah. no, you're number three, but most people can't make their way out of that. They're hungry. They live in, uh, they live on the street. They go to different shelters. Their school systems are a train wreck. People can barely read. That's the reality of 37% of the country. And no matter how hard they work, it's extremely difficult for them to come out of there. And I think if we uh, think otherwise, we're deluding ourselves. I think we agree on that. I just think we agree, we disagree on why it's like that and how you can get out of that. And I think that the idea that um, we're all just a bunch of poor slobs in the hood and we just can't get out unless somebody just puts money in our pocket. I didn't say it feels that. grossly offensive. There yeah, are there well, is so, ways so I, to work so I didn't say that. out, it's, but. However, that being said, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of disadvantages. And it's one thing that really bothers me about Republicans and conservatives specifically is the idea that no one on my side of the ideological aisle really wants to talk about the racial distress that happens and, 
and how discrimination and poor policy have led to these pockets of hopelessness where um, where the nexus of, of poverty and, and undereducation meet. And there are we we need a robust strategy to deal with that. But but the reason that I'm a Republican today and not a Democrat is because I started running an after school program in the inner city. And I got to look at how all the policies I supported my whole life actually worked on the ground. And I realized they don't work. You're right. A lot of people don't have access to opportunity. What is opportunity? Opportunity is knowing people. It's not enough. I mean, you need to be educated. We do have a public education issue. You need to be educated, but education is just a small piece of that. My husband and I pay a lot of money to live where we live because our children go to school with the children of CEOs and athletes and actors. Those are, their going to be their opportunity makers, right? In the future, I graduated with you. Do you have a job for me? We all got our jobs because at some point, because we knew somebody. So how do you solve a solution when you live in the hood and you don't have access to influential people? How do you get that kid out of there to meet influential people to have those opportunities? I think that's another policy discussion. School choice. Public schools keep kids trapped in their zip codes and you can't choose where you go to school. You can't choose to be in an, op in an area of opportunity like where I get to live now. Stuff like that. So again, these are conversations I think that where our we agree on the condition of people. I, I do, again, just to point out, I do resent the conservatives sort of like to ignore that part or ignore the condition of people and, and think that it's all just sort of self inflicted, that people are just lazy. And there's so many other circumstances. I just don't believe that the solution is taking more from someone else to give to somebody. The solution is helping people have opportunities. That's releasing them to flourish. And America doesn't owe us an opportunity. America is the opportunity. So you just being here on this soil is the opportunity. We have to teach people to take advantage of that. What do we have that can lift people out of where they are right now without having to take it from someone else? You, by virtue of being on this soil, your feet on this soil right now, you are already five steps ahead of literally everybody else on the face of the planet, no matter how poor you are or how wealthy you are. That says a lot about our country, but we're not exploiting the opportunity ship of America, I believe, particularly, if I may say, when it comes to the Black community. Well, I like, I like what you said, uh, if I was going to kind of paraphrase that one little part, is that it's, it's too easy to say everyone should pull, up, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and work hard. Yes, we all should do that, but it doesn't necessarily translate into um, success at the end because some people just have the deck kind of stacked against them. So I think we can find common ground on that. Yeah, there, there's a Harvard statistic um, that actually they did a study on what begets financial security and wealth. And, you know, it is it is your network is your net worth and typically wealthy parents breed wealthy children and so on and so forth. It's like at 97%, if you're wealthy, you will have kids that are financially very successful. All right, Michelle, you haven't asked a question. You got one for these two? Well, no, I was just, I guess I was just, I was listening to Kira and I was, I was curious how it is. I live in Florida and here for the education system, there is school choice. Um, there is a, a big credit to private schools. So which was a nice surprise to me this year. I found out. I was like, oh, right. thank you very much. <laughs> um, and they boss kids in to other to other you know affluent areas, or I guess what you call. It. So I was just curious if it's like that in other states um, because we we feel pretty fortunate here in Florida. Um, it depends. I think there are about 22 states across the United States that have some form of school choice. School choice differs from state to state. Could be vouchers like where you live or vouchers in Indiana. Could be ESAs like they have in Arizona. We've got an ESA. Uh, we've got ESA legislation weaving its way here in California. So it just depends on where you are. Yeah, I don't think we have those busing options in Maryland. You don't um, have that in Maryland. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay, I'm going to ask a question, and this should be interesting, and then we'll, we'll we'll leave it with that. So I was having a dialogue with someone who was a, like hardcore Democrat, uh, used to campaign for our California uh, politicians that were on the Democratic ticket, 
she actually said to me, she goes, Lori, I am going Republican. And I think more and more people are tilting in this 2024 to a different party because of progressiveness. This progressive movement is kind of tilting people to the other side of the aisle. What do you guys think? Is the Has the progressive movement gone too far? And if so, can can we reel it back in? I'm going to start with you, Juan. Okay, so I'm going to stay away from uh, policy, and I'll just stay. I'll say I'll stay with subjectivity here, right? So, okay. with social policies and the focus by mainstream Democrats on social policies, and and I will say I think those are the things that are most divisive to us. I think if Kira and I started talking about social policies, then it would get really spicy. But um, when you I, say social policies, what do you mean by that? Or out of abortion, um, um, okay. Gosh, uh, abortion, um, like gender, gender, gender right? identification, you know, yeah. uh, gender all, ideology. Uh, the environment, right? All yeah, of the right, right. Yeah. Yeah, any take, take your pick. Why I think the folks that you're talking about, Lori, have left or are considering leaving the Democratic Party is because, in, in many instances, the Democratic Party has abandoned the middle class. Uh, to forsaking kitchen table economic issues, regardless of whether you think where the money comes from, acknowledging that middle class people, working class people have a hard time making ends meet and it's getting harder. I think that's why some people have left the Democratic Party. And I think that's why uh, President Trump won in 2016 and why any Republican may have a chance against President Biden in 2024, because it doesn't take too many people feeling exactly how you said, Lori, in those swing and battleground states to flip to flip the presidency from Democrat to Republican. So uh, that's what that's that whole thing of why has the progressive movement alienated some people? I think it's the the focus on social issues at the expense of economic issues. Kira, what's your take on that? I was I was dying to hear your response because I just I literally was having this conversation one with a friend of mine who is a he's a Republican but he's a political consultant in Cleveland um, and Cleveland is largely black city is largely Democrat he's black and so um, he has been hired to consult for a couple of Democrat candidates because that's all there is in the hood that, that's just <laughs> how it is uh, and so he's. But this one guy that is 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 pretty, he's a moderate Democrat um, sounds like he's a lot like you and uh, and and he is getting attacked by the progressive because he's running against a progressive Democrat he's Democrat on Democrat and he was seeing how there's this internal party battle going on that is so uh, foreign to a lot of the more traditional Democrats. So I was just curious to to hear how someone from inside the party, I think you nailed it. Like I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have described my exit from the Democrat party the way you just did. But I think that's ultimately what it was, is that I felt left behind. I didn't feel, I had been told my whole life, well, you're black, you vote Democrat because Republicans are racist. But then I never really like asked myself, what's the Democrat party doing for me? Mm -hmm. And when I had the opportunity to serve my community actually intimately, and I realized, oh, they're not doing anything. There's a lot of people saying stuff, but there's nothing happening. And I think that was sort of an extension of that feeling of just feeling left behind. I don't know if it's enough people to swing an election. There's always people moving back and forth. This is the interesting thing about American politics. It's fluid. So I'm not convinced that it's enough to, to, to swing an election, but the unrest is surely palpable. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I I think I talk to a lot of union members and they're like, hey, I was a Democrat for years. But and 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 they'll say like almost the quote is this. I don't care about the woke stuff as long as you uh, focus on the economic issues for me. Yep. But when you have abandoned me on economic issues, I'm, I'm, I'm looking elsewhere. And I think to your point, there are statistics by Axios and other very credible news agencies that show the percentage of uh, blacks and Latinos that are moving to the Republican Party or to Trump or whatever have gone from like 10% to 20% and rising. And that could influence uh, the next election. It could. Well, those statistics are always tricky because it's the, the difference between likely voters and people who will actually go to the polls. And True. I always, 
uh, and, and not to, to uh, you know, put a damper on what Watt is saying, but I, as a conservative pundit, I know there were there will be conservatives watching and going, oh, wow, all these Black people moving over to the right. It's not like that. But if two or, but one's sense of what could upset the balance, I think, is is very astute. I mean, you Trump shifted 12 percent and that was enough in key areas to win. You know, you don't have to win the popular vote to win the presidency. You have to win key areas. So um, but I'm not sure, conservatives, that that means that there's this huge exodus to the Republican Party, because frankly, I don't think the Republican Party has a lot to offer Black Americans, to be honest. I don't think the Republican Party has been very, um, has been very generous in considering the grievances of Black Americans. Some of them may be misplaced. But some of them are are legitimate and deserve to be heard. And so Republicans who want these these disaffected black voters need to go get them. And that's something that I feel the Republican Party doesn't do very well. Yeah. Well, I, I will tell you that I have become much more conservative. I, I used to say that I come from the party of common sense. If it makes sense, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. But I feel like some of this progressiveness is a runaway freight train. And I feel as though, especially as a Californian, I am more and more being told how to think, like free thinking is out the window and what's acceptable and how I need to conduct. And I don't like that whatsoever. I like to have a logical viewpoint. I like to have healthy discourse with someone of a differing op difference of opinion. And I feel like we're losing a little bit of that and I don't like it at all. I, I think I, th I think you nailed it. You know, it's funny. I was sitting here thinking I was getting hot for a second, and then I I, I came back down. Uh, I'm gonna blame it. On <laughs> flu, I'm, I'm gonna blame it on flu A because I've got the flu and oh no, <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's that occupational hazard of campaigning. I hope I don't but, get sick now. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh no, not the mask. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, what I was gonna say is I I I like this show because as uh, passionate as Kira and myself got, I have a feeling that if Kira and I, uh, you know, I like to look at problems by saying, hey, instead of Kira being on one side of the table, me and the other, what if we got on the same side of the table and we put the problem over there? I bet you, you give Kira and I a weekend and an unlimited supply of coffee, we could come up with some great solutions together. So absolutely. And I think that would that would sell a whole lot more. I mean, when Make you the watch coffee, these, whiskey, and we're on. Yeah. yeah. When you watch these shows, I mean, I Lori and I always say, I'm like, why does it have to be so one sided? Let's bring people together. I think we're more yes. alike than we are different. And at the end of the day, when you you know, you talk talk about the economy, people are looking at what's going on at the gas pumps and at the grocery store <laughs> and you know, their paycheck. And those are the things that really are, you know, they're they're on they're the top tier of what people are are you know looking for. And they need help. Yeah, and I I just I, I, shit. Who cares about who sleeps with who? Like I'm done with that whole dialogue. I don't care. I care about our security. I care about our financial landscape. I care about poverty. I care about real issues. And I think sometimes we get so lost in just the fight. Like, hey, we're in for a good fight. You know what? I'm glad a West Pointer is in in putting your hat in the ring because you know what? We have too many damn lawyers. That's the problem. They are <laughs> they are trained to they're they're trained to fight, and that's what they do well. And that maybe that's part of the problem. Are you a lawyer, one? No, not at all. No, no. I, I I coach little league baseball. I'm like a regular guy. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> it, that's not what, a lawyer, a regular guy. I'm a regular guy. Yeah, he. Yeah, yeah, we could do a fewer lawyers. I I Ugh. agree with that. Although there and, is a, I will say though, as somebody who is involved in the education um, space, I ran for my school board last year. Actually, um, I will say that lawyers are going to be really important for parents coming up in the next few years. We are going to need a, a lot of civil rights attorneys, but yeah, we could use with a little less lawyering overall. I think yes. Yes. We need to cover that topic next. And and you know, I, I don't want to I use this is my my slogan, pull the pen out of the grenade and roll it in the center. But god damn, can we get some youth in our on the ticket? I mean, it's like uh, I can't even believe 2024 is gonna be weekend at Bernie's and then Trump again. I mean, like how what young, are we what's doing? Youth? 
what's youthful? Like our president's 80. So what's youthful <laughs> compared I mean, to that? At least a couple decades lower than that. I mean, how does, how does an 80 year old even relate to a Gen Z? It's just, it's, I don't know. I, I find it, it very you know, different. Funny, uh, it, it, so term limits, I, I've already said, Hey, uh, it should be two, ter two terms for Senate, six terms for Congress. That's 12 years, eight for a president. If you can't go up there and help make some significant change for the country, you should get out of the way and let someone else do it. And I think no one should be able to right. run over the age of 70. Yeah. You don't have pilots that are over 70. You don't have CEOs for the most part that are over 70. You know, all that wisdom is fantastic. Let's put them in the cabinet because at two or three in the morning, when the president has to wake up to answer the bell, my dad's 85. I love yeah. him. But that's that's not the guy I want. I'm 49 up. and I'm not. Right, I I'm know. 49, right? I'm not getting up at two. Right? If you call me at two in the morning, you're out of luck. Yeah, <laughs> it's Juan, let me ask you this, though. Can I just ask this question really quick? Because you mentioned term lim limits. Yes. And as someone who's running, I would love to get your opinion on this. Because I, I, I believe, I mean, it sounds logical to have term limits. And I think I'm in favor of them. But I heard an argument recently that someone said, if you institute two term limits in Congress, then basically what you're doing is establishing like a shadow government, because then it's just all the assistants and the 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 chief of staffs that stay it, like they stay, but the but the electorate changes. So basically, then you just have a a, a corporate or administrative body that's doing the work of Congress. That was the argument I heard. I don't know what I think about it. What do you well, think? I wonder if it was a Congress person. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, I, I think that the chiefs of staffs and all those staff members turn over, Kira. That's why they wheel people out on wheelchairs, right? Mm -hmm. And people stay when they can't talk mm -hmm. um, because the chiefs of staff and all the staff are one. Hey, if if Juan's gone. I'm gone, right? It's uh, not like the next right. person. That's a good point. Yeah, listen, this whole seniority thing and, oh, I'm going to stay until I'm the chairman of this and I'm the chair chairwoman of that, that's what's killing us. What we need to do is, like you and me, I'm going to sit down with my Republican colleagues and say, hey, where do we find common ground? Let's put the problem over there. Let's sit together. How do we start working on even an inch? If we got to go 99 yards, let's go a yard together, right? Because- Republican, Democrat, we got we have challenges and we want this republic to be as strong in the next 250 years as it has been for the first 250 with all its warts and all its challenges. You hit it best, Kira. You're better off being born here or being here than just about anywhere on, on the planet. Yeah. Until the robots come. Oh, Jesus. I'm not that's saying a, that's anything a different, bad that's a different about show. the robots. It's yeah. a different show, Lori. <laughs> yes. It's a whole different. We'll bring them I'd back. I'd like our robot overlords to know that I appreciate you. And yeah, geez. I bear you no ill will. Yeah, ding, ding. Okay, you guys ready to have a little fun? Sure, right, let's do it. it. Okay, we are going to do the luxury pickleball lightning round. All right? And luxury pickleball. If you know me, Juan, I am pickleball obsessed. And luxury pickleball is my go-to. I go -to. don't understand what's happened with I am not, in the last I am not a pickleballer either, Kira. I yeah, don't know. Well, okay. do, do, luxury, do you wear like a Gucci bag or something? Like, what does that mean? Luxury, thank you for teeing up our partner here. Luxury pickleball is quality on and off the court. You like that? No, it, so basically they have curated products and experiences and they're huh? very, yeah. So pickleball is the thing. Ah, I keep telling Michelle she's missing out. I, I, yeah, haven't done. Anyone died. can play. Anyone can yeah. play. That's the fun of pickleball. Yeah, I think that's, anyone, yeah, that's what it is. We yeah, have, we have a seniors, uh, a senior citizens development in our area, and they, they, there's a public pickleball court in it. And though, let me tell you something: the senior citizens have formed a mob. They are the mob. If you want a reservation on that pickleball ball court, you got to go through. Oh. The senior citizens. Yeah. Okay. And you know what? That they take mercy on you. I tell everyone do not underestimate the 75 year old grandma with the knee brace. She will take you out on the pickleball. They are for real about their pickleball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. So this is. This is the lightning round. I am. I picked five iconic statements made by former presidents, okay. and I want you to tell me who they were. I'm going to start oh, no. easy and soft, and it's going to be like a locomotive. Okay. Okay. Do I would we, like we, to point out. Do we press out... a button or uh, do we go by turn? How does that, or we write it down? No, no. Just, we'll just spew it out. 
Michelle, yeah. you're Michelle has no idea either. So you're in on this one. Oh, I know. Right. Okay. Okay, I would, here I'd we go. like to say that most of my public education was as a Canadian. So everything oh. I know about American history, right, I, I got to learn I got as an American. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is a soft toss. All right. I'm the only one on this stage who has hired people. Trump. Kara? Trump. That sounds right. Yes. Good job. We are three for three on that one. That would be true. Oh, okay. okay. If I had to name my greatest strength, I guess it would be my humility. Greatest weakness? It's possible that I'm a little too awesome. That sounds like something I would say. <laughs> Obama. I was going to say Obama too. Yeah I, would, yeah, I would go Obama too. It's totally Obama and I love it. It sounds like, a, yeah, that sounds yeah, like, it sounds like something that. he would say. Yeah, yeah, and he would say it he so always got the cool kind. Probably like on yeah. a talk show, like on Jimmy Kimmel yeah. or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, here we go. I'm not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. Ronald Reagan. Kara? Uh, Richard Nixon. <laughs> I think it's Reagan, and I think didn't um oh what's his name Chris Christie like use that comment at the Republican debate? Did he I use get, the same kind of I comment? I don't know Later. if he did, but you are right. It's Ronald Reagan, and that was the iconic statement he made when they talked about his age. Yep, against if, Walter Mondale. Yep. Yep. If if Biden or friggin' Trump pull oh. that one out of there, <laughs> I'll be really salt, really salty. Okay. Ooh, this is a good one. I would not like to be a Russian leader. They never know when they are being taped. The fact that the vernacular is taped should lead you to believe this is a beat ago. I got to say it, it's Biden. Who'd you say? Biden. Okay. Michelle? This is like Nixon or something. <laughs> Wow, I want to say Biden, but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go off script. I'm gonna say Kennedy. Nope. Mm. How ironic that Michelle is right that it is Nixon. Wow, <laughs> good job. Oh, hey, okay. It, it, okay. it, it, it would have been oh, better off. Wow. Yeah. I, are you four for four, Michelle? I she is. A, yeah. Oh, what do Michelle. I? What do I win? Do I get like a? Do I get a, like pickleball? Pickleball paddle. <laughs> Pickleball paddle. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Paddles. They're called paddles. You, you're officially a pundit after this. Okay. okay. Um, Nixon should have probably been a Russian leader. Okay. We're going to close out on this one because it's just, it's just the best of all time. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> Let's go. It's Bill Clinton. And listen, my daughter is 16 years old and she came home from her government class last week and said that they were going over the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky scandal. And I just want everyone to know that in 2023, we are still having sexual discussions with our children based on a presidential testimony. I had to have the most uncomfortable conversation with my daughter uh, about, about this. So we're still going through this, everybody. Wow. Well, yeah. And, and who can who can smoke a cigar with red lipstick and not get thoughts? I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't they have couldn't they have taught the Lewinsky scandal without like leaving that line out of the textbook or something? I guess not. I mean, one the line is iconic. He talked about it everything. Is iconic. <laughs> I mean, that I was about this is California. The, These yeah, are that was California the most schools. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. You can literally you do to basically those, anything. Uh, to, to, to make it official. You've got to say your choice. Um, I think we all know what it is, but Bill Clinton, Clinton our yeah. first yeah. black president. Clinton, Michelle won. You got. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Okay. You're a pundit now, Michelle. I'm impressed. All right. All right. Thank you guys so much for being with us today, Kira and Juan. And I, I just love this. And I think we need to have more dialogue like this because I've learned a lot actually coming out of this. And, and I thought I knew everything. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you all are awesome. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, and uh, Juan, good luck to you on the campaign trail. And where do people find out more about your platform and who you are? Lay it on us. I appreciate that opportunity. www.juan for Maryland, and it's spelled out my first name, F O R, Maryland spelled out.com. And all my social media is at Juan for Maryland. And 
listen, uh, my wife and my chief of staff and the social media person do all the posting. My wife has said that if she catches me do one more post, that she's off the campaign because I always have grammatical errors and <laughs> stuff's not right and <laughs> pictures are off and she's so that's it. I, I would love it's my sentiment, but I'm not allowed to post. Okay, yeah, I that's, think that is it. Smart, smart Very wife, smart. right? Yeah, smart, yeah. Wife. <laughs> smart wife, good life. Okay, Kira, what about you? If people want to lean into your platform. Well, I also engage in uh, thinking about issues in a way that I hope can bring people together on my podcast, Just Listen to Yourself with Kira Davis. It's available wherever you find your podcast. It's a podcast on critical thinking where we break down the talking points on hot topics of the day. Um, and you can, again, you can find that wherever you find your podcast. And then I have this book, Drawing lines, why conservatives must begin to battle fiercely in the arena of ideas. Look how pretty I look there. And um, <laughs> you can get that on Amazon or wherever fine books are sold. And if you would like to just hear me pontificating on anything at any given time, follow me on Twitter at Real Kira Davis. Love it. Okay. I think we did good, gang. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention this because. I'm in between seasons now, but speaking of wanting to just cool down the political rhetoric just a little bit, I do have another podcast that is a seasonal podcast. It's a Hallmark podcast. It's called A Very Merry Podcast, where my <laughs> partner and I, Amelia, reveal Hallmark movies and other cheesy Christmas movies throughout the year. It's done from a place of of being fans, but also loving to ridicule cheesy movies. So we have a great time doing that. Who's your Every favorite? Year. Who's your favorite um, Hallmark star? Do you have one? Well, she's gone now, but CCB, Candace Cameron Bure. Oh, is yes. I just Hallmark. met her. Princess of Hallmark is uh, Lacey Chabert. Yes, okay. she is. Yes, but yeah. the queen right. is CCB, but she's moved over to Great American. And actually, if you go to my Substack. Uh, just kiradavis.substack.com or just search my name on there. I wrote an article about what happened at Hallmark last year. There was a shift in, in management and it actually shifted the tone of the, of the films. And so one of the reasons CCB left and started with Great American. So, all right. Hmm. I don't, I'm such a nerd. Like who cares? I don't know. You, you are, you are a nerd nice. and you know what? Nerd is good. I love a good nerdy dialogue. Yes. Okay. All right, everyone, thank you for being with us and we will catch you next time on the quad. All right. Follow us on Instagram at she's a 10 times five. You can click on the link in our bio to listen to all of our previous episodes, as well as check out our live video interviews over our YouTube channel. You can also find us on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, pretty much wherever else you decide to listen to your favorite podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe.